So welcome everybody on this beautiful, uh, windy but sunny Adelaide day. My name is Megan Warren and I'm the director of the Fay Gale Centre for Research on um, Gender. And on behalf of the centre and the Academy, the Australian Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, I'd like to welcome you all to the annual Fay Gale Public Lecture. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting here today on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, for which they've been custodians for many centuries and on which they pe perform continuing ceremonies of celebration and renewal. And we acknowledge their living culture and their unique role in the life of this university and the region. Of course, it is a great honour for us to have Professor Genevieve Bell with us here today and a very warm welcome to you. And before I hand over to Professor Carol Johnson to introduce Professor Bell and say a few words about the Fay Gale Lecture in the Academy, I'd like to acknowledge all the Fay Gale members, Fay Gale friends, our Alliance of Gender Scholars and PhDs and postdoctoral students and other fellows from the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia, undergraduate and postgraduate students and representations and members of community organisations. We do have a few apologies um, from our VC, Peter Rathjen, from our DVCR, Mike Brooks, from our Executive Dean in the uh, Faculty of Arts, Professor Jenny Shaw, uh, Susan Oakley and Rachel Ankeny, and Professor Chris Beasley. You probably noticed that we are videoing the session today, so it's a good opportunity to turn your phones off. Uh, and if you need amenities, they're just out by the lifts in the foyer. So the lecture will finish today at half past one, and there will be light refreshments, sandwiches and so forth out where the tea and coffee is. So we'd really love you to stay if you have the time and enjoy that with us. And I'd like to now invite Professor Carol Johnson, who is herself a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, to tell us a little bit more about the annual Fay Gale, Fay Gale Lecture and to introduce Genevieve. Well, I'm introducing and welcoming Professor Genevieve Bell today on behalf of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia. And the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia, ASA, promotes excellence in the social sciences in Australia and in their contribution to public policy. The Academy is an autonomous, non-governmental organisation devoted to the advancement of knowledge and research in the various social sciences. ASA's public forums program, of which this is part, aims to raise awareness of the social sciences within the community among policy makers and opinion leaders and to highlight the relevance of the social sciences for public policy. And this Faye Gale lecture honours the late Professor Gwendolyn Faye Gale AO, 1932 to 2008, who quite a few of us in this room um, knew and had gigantic respect for. She was the Academy's first female president from 1997 to 2000. Professor Gale was the first honours graduate in geography at the University of Adelaide and went on to become an eminent human geographer. She was well known for her contributions to academia, the advancement of women within, within academia, indigenous studies and juvenile justice. She was elected as a fellow of the Academy in 1978 in 1989, she received the Order of Australia for her contributions to the social sciences, most notably in the fields of geography and indigenous studies. She served as Vice Chancellor of the University of Western Australia from 1990 to 1997. To honour Professor Gale's contributions to both the Academy and the Social Sciences, the Academy each year invites a distinguished female social scientist to present the Faye Gale Lecture at two universities, and it will be filmed and available on the Academy's website in due course. We have also timed this lecture to occur as part of the inaugural Social Sciences Week, promoting the value of social sciences across Australia. Please feel free to tweet, tagging in us at Academy, at ACAD SOCSI, um, at SOCSI Week, and with the hashtag Social Science Matters that ups there, is up there on the screen. Now, a few words about Professor Genevieve Bell. Professor Bell is the director of the 3A Institute, the Florence Violet Mackenzie Chair, and distinguished professor at the Australian National University 
as well as a Vice President and Senior Fellow at Intel. Professor Bell is a cultural anthropologist, best known for her work at the intersection of cultural science and technology development. Professor Bell heads the 3A Institute, co-founded by the ANU and CSIRO's Data61, which is tasked with building a new applied science around the management of artificial intelligence, data, technology, and their impact on humanity. Professor Bell also presented the highly acclaimed ABC Boyer Lecture Series for 2017, Fast, Smart and Connected, What It Is to Be Human and Australian in a Digital World. She was also the South Australian Thinker in Residence from 2008 to 2010. On a more personal note, I'm particularly delighted to be introducing Professor Genevieve Bell today, although unfortunately I have to say that I have to leave to give an undergraduate lecture at 1pm, so we'll have to be rely on hearing the recording of the lecture, which I'm very pleased is taking place. I first met Genevieve some 15 years ago, before she was quite as well known as she is today when a mutual British colleague suggested that my partner and I might be suitable subjects for Genevieve to interview in an absolutely fascinating ethnographic research project that she was undertaking, interviewing couples from a variety of countries, including, unusually for US-initiated research at the time, Asian countries, about their mobile phone use. She absolutely established in her words that mobile phones are, quote, as much cultural objects as technology objects, unquote. I was excited then by Genevieve's account of being an anthropologist working for a cutting edge technology company like Intel, and her work absolutely demonstrates the benefits that industry engagement can bring both to the social sciences and to the industries involved. Uh, since then, as someone who's interested myself in technology, albeit from a policy perspective, I've followed Genevieve's work with great interest and in addition to the Boyer lectures, which are available online in both audio and transcript form, could I particularly recommend two wonderful articles which you'll find listed on her website. Her 2011 piece, Unpacking Cars, Doing Anthropology at Intel, and her 2018 piece, Making Life, A Brief History of Human-Robot Interaction, which incidentally makes some really important points about the need for regulation. But now it is time to hear from Professor Genevieve Bell herself discussing decolonising artificial intelligence. So, great pleasure. I'll hand over to Genevieve. That is a daunting introduction indeed. Thank you, Carol. And thank you to all of you. It is a pleasure and a privilege to get to be both back in Adelaide and to be delivering a lecture in the honor of uh, Faye Gale. I wanna begin as I like to begin everything I get to do in this country by acknowledging that we meet on Aboriginal country. I like to be able to say that it's country that I grew up on. I also like to be able to do that because I've spent 30 years living in the United States where it is never acknowledged that they meet on country that had previous occupants. And I find that an oddly distressing omission so there is something powerful about getting to make that reminder here in Australia and to remind ourselves that it's not just a ritual activity, but a reminder of both the, in some ways, responsibility that comes with being in that country and telling those stories. And for me, in thinking about future technologies, grounding myself in a place that has a 60,000 year history is an important one. So I want to acknowledge that we meet on that country. I also want to kind of tip my hand to the fact that it is an incredible privilege to be delivering a lecture in Professor Gale's honor. I grew up around Faye's work and Faye's books and Faye's legacy. My mother and Faye were old friends and colleagues and Faye's books graced my house from as long as I can remember and Faye's accomplishments, a litany of firsts that Carol lovingly recites were celebrated in my household as accomplishments of real scope and real merit. And the notion of someone whose life threaded the needle of academic policy and regulatory work as well as spanning indigenous women's and social justice issues were issues close to my mother's heart, Professor Diane Bell, and also the ones that I grew up with. So it's a daunting moment to have to stand in a place with Faye's nail name somewhere around me because that was uh, one of the stories that I heard about what it meant to be a successful social scientist as a kid. 
It's also the case that a year ago, as Carol rightly points out, I delivered the Boyer lectures. What no one knows is that I took into the recording studio Faye's copy of Stanner's Boyer lectures because Faye herself was one of the Boyer lectures, as was Stanner, and I was lucky enough to have her copy of his lectures. And it was my talisman in the studios as a kind of, okay, I can do this, <laughs> because I know other people who had. So this lecture is a little unusual. Uh, as Carol suggested, I've spent my life at this point, my working life outside of the academy. So this isn't a written paper. This is in fact an experiment in lots of things. And it's an experiment in a thought exercise that I hope does justice to Faye because it attempts to thread both an academic interrogation of a technical object and that technical object itself. I want to do it as something that is a living document and iterative. I did deliver this lecture two days ago, but the one I'm about to deliver now turns out to be completely different. <laughs> so go me. <laughs> also go you, because this is now an experiment. All right, so what I wanted to do was do something that attempts to take a form of social science inquiry and bang it up against a technological object and see where that gets us. There's a couple of things you need to know at the outset of all of that. In addition to my more formal biography, here are the other pieces you need to know. I am indeed a cultural anthropologist, but I was also raised by cultural anthropologists. So I grew up on my mother's field sites in central and northern Australia in the 1970s and 1980s. I spent my childhood living in places like Ali Karang and Alice Springs, and I was lucky enough to be living in communities with Aboriginal people who took my brother and I and my mother onto their country and told us their stories. So I spent my childhood without shoes, mostly speaking Walpri, and getting to kill things. And then eat them. I hasten to add, because otherwise I sound like a sociopath. Um, and that was arguably like best childhood ever. And it's an incredibly long way from Ali Karang to Intel. And I got there in a roundabout way. Uh, I went to America to do my graduate training and did my undergraduate training. I finished my PhD at Stanford in the late 1990s. My background at that point was in Native American ethno history, feminist and queer theory. You can immediately see how Intel would hire me. <laughs> that was such an obvious connection. Um, and the reality is in 1998 I landed a job at Intel because in true Australian fashion I met a man in a bar. For those of you who are postgraduates or undergraduates or even graduates, this is not career advice. Um, <laughs> I met a man in a bar, he asked me what I did. I said I was a social scientist, and indeed I said I was an anthropologist. He said, what's that? I said, I studied people. He said, why? I said, they seemed interesting. He went, he said, hmm. At this point I should have worked out he was an engineer. Um, <laughs> truthfully, sorry for the engineers in the room. Um, he said, what do you do with that? I said, I'm a professor. And he said, couldn't you do more? And I thought, yes, I could stop speaking to you which indeed I did. So you should imagine my surprise when he called me at my house the next day, because we're talking 1998, before Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Tinder, uh, before Google. Uh, though these days, if you were to type redheaded Australian anthropologist into Google's white box, the very first search term that will turn up is me. So I have hacked that algorithm. But back in 1998, my new friend from the bar just called every anthropology department in the Bay Area looking for the said redheaded Australian. And Stanford said, oh, you mean Genevieve, and gave him my home phone number. <laughs> so I ended up in industry because I hung out in bars and Stanford had bad privacy practices. <laughs> I had a career there because it turned out to be one of the most interesting places to practice anthropology. It turned out that if what anthropology is best at is making sense of patterns of culture, and more to the point, not just doing it in an abstract way, but doing it because it creates the possibility of an intervention and the possibility of building something new, then doing anthropology in industry was one of the best places to do it. Locking all of that up inside universities turned out to be not, for me, the path I wanted to pursue. And the ability to take an anthropological worldview and use it to both critically interrogate technology but also create the possibility of building new things was, for me, an important intellectual and professional place to find my way in the world. Mum was always really clear when we were growing up that you had a moral obligation to make the world a better place, to build something better than the way you found it, and then that should be on behalf of others, not yourself. And for me, Intel was a powerful and interesting place to get to go do that. It also meant I learned a tremendous amount about technology. And in that process, and certainly over the last five years, I spent a great deal of my day job, both there and here, thinking about artificial intelligence. And that's where I want to kind of auger the rest of this talk. Artificial intelligence is many things. It is a rhetorical discourse. It is a subject of an enormous amount of hype. It is a place where there are multiple government inquiries going on inside the Australian kind of scene at the moment. It is a place where we talk about 
job loss and job creation. We worry about the robot apocalypse and killer robots. But one of the things that AI is in particular is a story, and it is a story that has a particular kind of character to it, one that I find instantly recognisable, because it is presented to us as though it were an immutable object. AI is stable and present and, frankly, in the ways it is talked about, both inside and outside tech companies, it seems inevitable. And for me, that makes it an object that ought to instantly be subject to a kind of scrutiny that I think for those of us who are social scientists in the room should feel very familiar. And that's the piece of scrutiny I want to subject to it to now. I somewhat cheekily called this talk decolonizing artificial intelligence because I wanted to bring together two ideas that don't often sit in the same place together. I realize I need to pause here, however, briefly and ask how many people in the room are in fact social scientists or would consider themselves thus? Excellent. And how many people in the room would consider themselves to be computer scientists or engineers? Excellent. All right, good. I know the territory I'm tracing then. All right, so here's the thing. Lots of ways to think about decolonization. For me, imagine it is a bundle of theoretical and epistemological moves, by which I mean to say it is a way of thinking about and approaching the world. It proceeds on two bases. One, that colonial activity and any other move of powerful institutions takes over a space and through often violent means rearranges the bodies and the patterns and the things within that space to resemble itself. The second piece of that move, that theoretical move, is that you can read that moment against itself and find inside of it resistances, disorders, and other ways of basically the pre-colonial move. And so what decolonization often is, is a theoretical move, is to say you can take any moment in time and read back into it both the impulse of the colonial and the things that existed beforehand. For decolonization as a theoretical move, there are lots of tools. I want to just pick on four of them. One, the notion of how you give things a prehistory, so the moment that exists before the history turns up, the moment before the word. The notion of the kind of feminist intervention of how you use mess and mundanity as a way of opening up the space. Notions of the subaltern and notions of things that are silent and erased. So I want to kind of take those four things and use them as a way to think about artificial intelligence. So let's start with the notion of a prehistory. One of the things that is particularly true in techno-deterministic discourses, or indeed the story of Silicon Valley, is that every technology is presented as though it turned up fully formed right then, right now. One of the most interesting things to me about artificial intelligence is the language that is wrapped around it circa 2018 suggests that it just turned up recently and that it was always as presented. Of course, the reality about most technologies is they took a lot longer to get to being fully formed and fully functional than any of the stories allow. There were usually a lot of messes and complexities and other characters involved. There were other funding sources. There were lots of things going on. But the story we tell tends to be these incredibly straightforward ones that tidies all of that stuff up. To think about artificial intelligence, at least for me, one of the ways you have to think about it is to give it back its history. And to in some ways give it back the history before it was called artificial intelligence. So how did we even end up at that moment in 2018? Well, you actually have to go back. You have to go back, it turns out, to the late 1800s and the early 1900s when people were starting to imagine making mechanical brains. The very first instances of this that I can trace back are in about 1913, 1914 with a bunch of weather scientists on the east coast of the United States who were talking about creating a machine, basically a calculator, that would take data about climate and create models of the climate moving forward. It was a tide monitor but with some other pieces attached to it. Fisher and Harris are their names and they describe the object they build as the great brass brain. Delightfully it is now known as the old brass brain because there was a second generation which is kind of fabulous. But the brain is the metaphor they use for this object that is clearly mechanical, it has a lot of moving parts. But very much the notion they are imagining here is that it is a level of abstraction beyond a calculator and the brain is the language they could get to. By the 1930s and 1940s, that language has moved out of the scientific community already into public discourse. So you have uh, the Duke of York in a 1935 talk in Britain talking about the future of technology will be electronic brains and the notion that we will make these objects brain-like and that the progression of technology will be the capacity to make things that are capable of things that brains are capable of. And here it's always human brains. And the notion very much is the notion of the thing that the brain does that is interesting is manage complexity and abstraction. 
And you see that language running through the first and second generations of computing objects. So the very first thing that we would recognize as a computer that we would understand as for today was built in 1945 and turned on in 1946. It was the ENIAC. It starts up at the University of Pennsylvania. It is described as an electronic brain by both its architects and its builders, and indeed in the local newspapers, that's how it is described also. It's also really just an electronic calculator. All it does is take a manual calculator process and run it through valves. It was two times the size of this room. It did four functions only, addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication. It did them 10,000 times faster than a human being, uh, but at the cost of six suburbs worth of electricity. So one kilobit for every 135 kilowatts. So effectively, when they turned on the computer at the University of Pennsylvania, the joke in Philadelphia was, oh, they're computing at the university because all the lights would flicker. <laughs> so electronic brain, but a little spendy in terms of power. By the time you get to the second and third instantiations of that, this would be, depending on how you cut it, this image here is either the second or the fourth stored memory computer in the world. It is the second stored memory computer in the world to be built. It is the fourth stored memory computer in the world to be turned on because this was built at the University of Sydney and suffered through the power sh shortages of 1948, 1949, when electricity was a debated commodity in Australia. You might want to ask yourself how much has changed since then. The answer is not very much. But these things were understood as being brain-like, right? A whole lot of the ways that they were described in terms of their architecture, there was a notion of this idea about input. So we would put ideas in, ideas would come out, calculation would happen in the middle. People were already starting to use this kind of language again to suggest they were like brains. The interesting rhetoric here was that they were like brains but better because they were going to be faster. And so there's this notion of speed that starts to attend very quickly. You get a pivot, however, by the mid 50s coming out of the UK, where a man named Alan Turing, arguably sometimes talked about as the grandfather of artificial intelligence, but an incredibly important progenitor of contemporary computing, had been involved in a bunch of um, crypto activity and code breaking during World War II, was a mathematician, was exiled to Manchester in the late 1940s, early 1950s because he was gay in a time period where that was not appropriate. He was chemically castrated and taken away from all of his work and sent into exile and taken away from actual physical technical objects. What's interesting about that moment and also tragic is that it sent him into a philosophical theorizing about machinery absent the building of it. And in that time period, he started to say, maybe thinking about these as intelligent isn't the right notion or brains. What we should be thinking about them is that they are doing the work of thinking. And he wrote a paper in this period of time, which is entitled, Can a Machine Think? Now, to entitle a paper that is to already imagine that the thinking is possible, right? It's not, is, will a machine ever think? It's, well, can the machine think? And then for him, thinking became very critically indexed around the notion of could a machine engage in a question and answer? So the thinking piece was, could you ask the, the machine a question and it give you an answer and that go on as a discourse? He was basing that on the notion of a British cocktail party game called The Imitation Game at that point, which was effectively a game about sending people into other rooms and attempting to determine if you could work out who they were based on a question. It tells you a lot about British cocktail party, <laughs> frankly, as far as I can tell, as much as anything. We now know that, of course, as the Turing test. The Turing test was designed to be this notion of if you could have an interrogator on one side of a wall and on the other side of the wall a human and a computer, and the interrogator asks a series of questions of the human and the computer on the other side of the wall, the point at which the human can no longer tell who is answering the question means that the computer will have passed the Turing test. It will have been able to act like a human being. For him, that notion of handling the abstractions that actually are the way questions and answers happen was the critical piece of thinking here. And his notion of the abstraction was it would be discursive and always in relationships. And that's important, right? The notion of thinking here was that it was conversational and that it was a give and take. Because that idea gets lost quite quickly, but persists in Turing's work, but doesn't necessarily make it across the ocean. The actual term artificial intelligence is coined in 1956 and it's coined at an academic conference at Dartmouth College, a six-week event over the summer of 1956, sponsored by the National Science Foundation and charted by a series of people, including Claude Shannon, who is one of the early theorists of communication theory. So Shannon, who was at Bell Labs, 
Marvin Minsky, who would go on to be one of the leaders of computer science at MIT, and John McCarthy, who was at that point a mathematician at Dartmouth, but who would join Minsky at MIT. In 56, they brought a whole lot of people together. They started to speculate where computing would take them. And you have to remember, we're talking 1956. So in 1956, computers had been around for a decade. In that decade, they had gone from the ENIAC, 2x the size of this room, to a mainframe not much bigger than this podium plus. So the size of computing had shrunk. It obviously no longer required six suburbs worth of power, <laughs> and it had gotten much more powerful. That first 10 years was seen by people like Minsky and Shannon as a precursor for a much greater, steeper ramp. So original hype curb, right? If that was the first 10 years, shit, what was the next second and third and next decades gonna look like? So they were confronting this notion of this incredible increase in the power of computing. And a whole lot of other actors in the network are now interested in thinking about what these computers are gonna do. So faced with the notion of an incredible compute budget of possibility, these guys sit down and come up with an agenda. And what they say is that artificial intelligence is gonna be the following thing. The study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. The notion here is that you could break into pieces everything that human intelligence was constituted and then have machines handle each one of the individual pieces. Now, of course, sitting inside that is an idea about both what human intelligence looks like, an idea that you can break human intelligence down into single pieces and that those pieces can be simulated, frankly, at this point through mathematics. That was the idea. One of the people who participates in this event but isn't at this event is an American behavioral psychologist called B.F. Skinner. Because it turns out, if you're a bunch of mathematicians and logicians and you want to work out how do you so precisely describe the human condition as to be able to make a machine simulated, it helps to have someone who believes that humans are remarkably like machines. And that was Skinner. Skinner at that point, you know, believed that humans were effectively electrical impulses in, electrical impulses out, operant conditioning possible in the middle. So his vision of humans were that they were remarkably like machines. So the ideas that underpin this are in fact ideas that are also about erasing other things. Skinner is a response to continental psychology. Skinner is a response to Freud and Jung. Skinner is about erasing the unconscious and the id and the idea of things that were unmanageable and messy. So you already have lurking inside this notion of artificial intelligence other intellectual ideas that were doing other pieces of work. The important thing here though is what it is they imagined would be their first targets. So we're going to so precisely simulate the human condition that a machine can do it. What are the things they want to do? Well, number one is make machines use language. So effectively this was can we have machines understand discourse and in fact more importantly do real-time translation. That was what they wanted, instant and immediate translation. Second thing is form abstractions and concepts. That's lovely. I love this third one. Solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans <laughs> and improve themselves. And you're like, yeah, okay, good. And this became the brief and the blueprint for what artificial intelligence would be in 1956. It's what gets funded, it's what gets built around, and that is in some ways its prehistory. So brains, thinking, straight to, well, you know, simulating our behavior into little tiny mathematical pieces. So that's one thread. Well, what if you were to come at it a different way and say, okay, so it's got a prehistory, but how would you make it messy, right? How would you unpack that notion? Because again, if I say artificial intelligence, that feels remarkably stable and tidy. Well, I think there are two ways to do it. One is that you could actually say, well, what do we really mean in 2018 when we say AI? What's lurking underneath the hood? Because there isn't actually artificial intelligence. It's not a single monolithic technological object that you can point at. You can't go, oh, that's AI. Oh, there it is there too. Like the AI doesn't exist in the way, for instance, a mobile phone exists. They're different objects. So what would you need to do to pull it apart? Well, I think there are five things plus one that lurk under that name, right? First one is data. Remarkably absent in the 1956 articulation of artificial intelligence, it turns out in order to precisely describe things, you need data. That's what that was about, right? If you want to think about it this way, data is AI's original sin. It can't proceed without it, but whatever it is will colour it in perpetuity and permanently. 
So the data piece is important, right? How is the data collected? What does the data represent? Where does it come from? Whose data is it? What isn't in the data? All turn out to be really important. We hear a lot about bias in data. Not all of it is necessarily uh, intentional or designed to discriminate. I have colleagues of mine uh, up at a Queensland research institution who say their data suffers from possibly the best bias I've ever heard. They say, our data is fair weather and daylight biased. I was like, what does that mean? Like, well, it's photos of the reef and you can't throw someone off the back of a boat with a camera when it's dark, also in a storm. <laughs> so their data is daylight and fair weather biased. But that also means the models they can make are models when you can see reefs in daylight and good weather. And it turns out that's not necessarily the only condition you would want. If you were to build an intervention based on it, you can see how the challenges would be. Second piece that made up artificial intelligence in the 21st century is algorithms. Algorithms are not that complicated. All this simply means is the automation of a task or a series of tasks underneath a single mechanism where you no longer need to decide the individual pieces. I'm willing to bet most people in the room have used a washing machine, because if you hadn't, I would have other questions. <laughs> Here's the thing about a washing machine. If you've ever used the delicate cycle, you are using an algorithm. Because the delicate cycle determines for the machine, it says, okay, delicate cycle, cold water, one rinse, low agitation, low spin. It's an algorithm, right? It automates a set of tasks, and you don't need to know what the pieces are in order to have your clothes not be mangled by your washing machine. It's simply an algorithm. Algorithms are no more or no less than that. Of course, in that, that means you've made a whole series of decisions about what goes with what and how things should proceed. And all of those are evoking notions about the way the world works that get increasingly invisible. If you wanted to change the way your washing machine does things, you have to have a degree of awareness about how those decisions are made to break the algorithm open. Third piece of artificial intelligence at this point in the 21st century is about machine learning. So think back to that 1956 statement of the machine will improve itself. The idea here is that the computational object is primed with data. It now could automate a series of processes, but to adapt and evolve over time, it needs to have a mechanism by which it can learn more about the world. It can learn how to make sense of the data it is collecting. It can learn if that algorithm is successful or not. Most of the methods by which computational objects learn currently are statistical. Don't let anyone fool you when they say machine learning. This really just means if you know statistics, you know machine learning. These are things like correlations and branch decisions. <laughs> That's all it is, right? There are some other categories of machine learning that are new and slightly more complicated, sometimes called unsupervised learning, where effectively, rather than telling the machine what the answer should be, you suggest to it there is an answer and it attempts to go find it. There are some interesting challenges to that, of course, that have to do with whether you can reproduce that result over time. And if you are using that method in an area that is tightly scrutinized or regulated, having a machine make decisions that it then cannot explain, not such a good look. Fourth thing that sits in here is this notion of sensing. So the computational object can be primed with data, it can have a sequence that it will perform tasks, it can learn things over time, but how will it learn about the world around it? What are its mechanisms for engaging with the world in which it finds itself? At the moment, sensing is pretty straightforward. It's things like cameras, microphones, temperature sensors, GPS. It can also be things like environmental sensors. It can be the ability to read a Wi-Fi network and see who's in it. It can be all manner of things. But those sensors are now an entire mechanism by which these computational objects make sense of the world. And oh, by the way, every one of those has an algorithm sitting behind it too, and they are complicated. Fifth and finally is the logic. And by here, I don't mean the computational logic. I mean, what is the reason that you are collecting data, building algorithms, learning about the world, and sensing the world? What is the rationale that holds together those objects? Because each AI actually is doing a particular task. It is being built to do a thing. It is not being built to just be generically artificially intelligent. It's being built to, well, in the instance of a place like this, run the elevator system. So smart lifts, mostly in big buildings, now use artificial intelligence to determine where to arrange the carriages, which floors get the most traffic, over time how you stagger things. The logic there is about rearranging carts in a manner that both saves energy and doesn't inconvenience humans too much. That's what I mean by logic. How are all the pieces being pulled together? 
And then the plus one is that of late, it has been hard to hear people talk about artificial intelligence without talking about ethics. But make no mistake here, this is not about ethical technology. This is about the consequences of the deployment of AI. So it's part of the conversation, but it is not yet part of the technical array. And I think there is an argument to be made that there are some other moves going on under that hood that might require a different kind of interrogation. So that's one way of making AI messy, right? You kind of go, well, it isn't AI, it's actually all these other things. And oh, by the way, over time, new things will get added to this list and some of these things may well drop off. The other way of talking about it and making it messy would be to go, yeah, okay. Um, who is commissioning this AI? Who is paying for it? What forms of power is it reinforcing and reinscribing? And how would you make sense of those things? Well, one of them would be to go and look at the history of the funding cycles around artificial intelligence in Europe and the US. Were you to Google that now and to Google the phrase AI winter, you would find a retrospective analysis of the waxing and waning of funding. What's of course interesting about that phrase is it was created 20 years after the first waxing of funding and waning of funding and was used to rationalize what was already happening. The reality here, of course, is that back in 1956, when McCarthy and Minsky et al. put out their first blueprint, they imagined that computing would increase the way it had in that first decade, and it didn't. They imagined that they would have raw compute power to do tasks that weren't available to them. But that also meant they made promises and excited people about prospects. That meant by the 1960s, there were a lot of stakeholders going, oi! Like, you promised us this, and you haven't delivered. Complicatedly, one of those first stakeholders for that initial tranche of AI was, of course, the United States government, and in particular, the Defense Department. And what the Defense Department wanted was the ability to translate, not simultaneously, but instantaneously, documents in Russian into English. Now, those of us in the room who are social scientists know that one of the things about language is that translating it requires understanding context, not just words. Um, and that, in fact, one of the art of translating isn't the literal translation of the words into other words. It is the meaning making around it. The apocryphal tale that is frequently told about this period is of a back and forward translation of the phrase, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We all know that as a phrase. Uh, the back translation of that became the alcohol is strong and the meat is bad. <laughs> I want to suggest those are two completely different notions <laughs> and that if you were basing some kind of strategy on the former and the latter, you would end up in two very different places, one in a church and the other in a restaurant. <laughs> so thinking through the problems here meant that for a period of time, the notion of translation was a goal here that was undeliverable because in fact, not only was there not enough data to know how you do those simultaneous translations, but the work of translation is actually a work of culture, not just a work of words. And so by the mid-1960s, there were a number of stakeholders who put a lot of money into this who weren't happy. Uh, by the mid-1970s, there were a number of stakeholders in multiple countries who weren't happy, and there was a transformation in funding and a restriction of funding to a much more instrumentalist breakthrough. By the mid-1980s, there was a second wave of criticism about, again, the work of AI, and again in this context of simultaneous language activity, uh, mostly out of CMU. By this point, you'd started to see industry picking up some of the slack in funding from government. By the 90s and the aughts, most of the artificial intelligence work was being done inside companies under other names. It was called intelligent agents, it was called or other things. What's interesting there is that part of what you get to the breakthrough of the 21st century is both the abundance of data that made possible training some of these algorithms and creating some of these new techniques was the sheer preponderance of data. An enormous amount of that data turns, up, turns out to be locked up in commercial enterprises, who, by the way, have very different intents. So if the intent of those early artificial intelligences was about simultaneous, instantaneous translation of languages, I think it's safe to say the logic that propels forward much of the AIs of the 21st century is not that. It is in fact indeed more about can I know you and your desires so exquisitely that I can anticipate your next action in order to provision you with goods and services. So where it went from simultaneous translation to the ultimate manifestation of late capitalism in different ways, right? But thinking about that would give you, again, a different way of unpacking it. So rather than saying a single AI, the question might be to ask, 
Who's AI? What work is it doing? And why? And then the second order of questions might be to ask, would AIs look different in different countries or if primed with different data sets and different logics? And the thought exercise I would suggest here is, think about the contrast between an AI object or an AI constellation that was raised on data sourced from a laptop that was stationary with a single IP pipe where the queries are text-based and instrumentalist and often about goods. What is the world view you would build there versus an AI object or objects that was raised on data that came from mobile phones that had location data and meta tagging and where you knew not only where that object was in time but in space, you knew what other objects were proximate to it and the data you sourced was both visual data and social chat. And now imagine what worlds you might build on top of that and what those AIs might know and what they might do. My suspicion is they may proceed in completely different directions. And oh, by the way, both of those already exist. So what else could you do if you were going to keep this kind of thread of decolonizing? Well, there's the, can you give it a prehistory? There's the, could you make it messy? Well, then I think there's the classic kind of technique of could you read back against the grain? Like, could you read for the erasures and the silences, right? What other things that the stories we tell about AI forget, <laughs> remove, or make slippery around the edges, right? What might some of those be? I think there are three kind of big ones, right? The first one is around the notion of consciousness, which is not the same as intelligence. That one of the interesting semantic slippages in English is when I say artificial intelligence, somewhere lurking in your English-speaking brains, at least, is the move where you go, ooh, artificial intelligence. <laughs> Sentience, awareness, consciousness, kill John Connor. And it happens just like that. We go from artificial intelligence to killer robots through three other moves. And it's remarkably quick. Because sitting inside our socio-technical imaginations are notions about what artificial intelligence might really be and what we think it is allied to. And of course the reality is if you look back at some of the early progenitors of both thinking machines and AI, they were thinking around this notion, right, of was intelligence the same as consciousness? Probably not. Were these machines conscious? Mm, only in science fiction. But then you have these other questions we might want to ask, right, which is, can we imagine non-human objects that have intelligence? Can we imagine non-human objects that have consciousness or sentience? We certainly can, because then you go down the path of thinking about bees and dolphins and primates, where there are certainly clear arguments to be made about everything from awareness to consciousness to sentience different arguments about the degree of intelligence that is there, but if you look at you know, my colleagues like Andrew Barron at the University of Macquarie, who spends a lot of time thinking about bees and bee sentience, there is a strong argument there that bees have a degree of intelligence that might be more interesting to model computationally than humans. They understand symbolic interactions, they are capable of managing the translation of information that is abstract, like distance and time and space. They recognize each other inside hives for no discernibly instrumentalist reason. There are interesting things going on there, right? So what happens if you take away the notion of intelligence as having to be human? Would be one move you could do here. The other one would be to say, why is it that we imagine that consciousness and sentience only adhere to living things? I can think of plenty of cultures in the world who imagine that non-animate objects are themselves sentient under certain circumstances or conscious under others. So what might it mean to divorce all of that entirely from the notion of humanness or livingness would be a completely different move, right? I can think of cultures that imagine inanimate objects have moments of consciousness and sentience and who are called in and out of those states. So how might we position that as a way of opening up that conversation, right? Another way to do it would be to say, well, with a few notable exceptions, the artificial intelligence community is pretty silent to the notion of a body other than a robotic body where the body is a feedback mechanism. I mean, Rodney Brooks and Toby Walsh would both reasonably assert here that they spend a lot of time talking about the body. I would counter to them that they're not, they're, they're not often loud enough in that discourse and that what it means to think about a body isn't simply a shell through which you receive feedback from the rest of the world, but in fact a mechanism by which you encounter the world and are in turn encountered. So thinking about what happens when you say artificial intelligence is a move 
that in some ways gets rid of the body and the complexities of that and the ways in which bodies are experienced and manifested and regulated. And the notion then of thinking about what it means to give these objects back a body is in fact an interesting question of how they will be encountered and of how we might want to think about that. So again, you know, what does it mean to think about the body of artificial intelligence when at the moment it's still a computer, but at some point it's going to be an autonomous vehicle, it's going to be a drone, it's going to be a robot, it's going to be a lift. How are we going to think about what those are as embodied objects, how we will signal them and how we will engage with them? And then last by no means least, I do think there is this interesting question again about control and power. AI is remarkably silent to the notion of what it might control or how it might be controlled. It is remarkably presented as a neutral object, but we know that that's never true, right? Ways of seeing the world are entirely tied up with power. The way these objects might be enacted by whom and under what circumstances is not again a random thing. They are deeply tied up with other ideas. So what might it be to read control back into that or power back into it? The notion of so precisely describing things that a machine can be made to simulate it is an interesting move. <laughs> and thinking about what it would mean to read things back into that as a degree of complexity, I think it's worth pursuing. There is always my favorite piece of the post-colonial and decolonization toolkit, which is the bit about subalterity. So here, you know, I want to evoke both Gramsci and Ranjit Guha and the notion that any, um, any discourse always has a series of histories from, as Gu Guha and Gramsci would put it as histories from below, or as I think Spivak might put it, voices from the peripheries. So does AI have a set of other alternative narratives that you might need to listen to? And if so, what would they be? And what might it be to put those into the conversation too? Well, one of them's hardly from below or from the margins because it runs through every conversation we have about AI. We just don't talk about it a lot. Which is, of course, that it is hard to talk about artificial intelligence as a technical object without thinking about it as an imagined object. And that things have been brought to life with some degree of intelligence from at least 200 years ago. We are all within minutes of the 200th anniversary of the publication of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I know this because I have to go talk about it tomorrow, so go Mary. Um, that story, of course, is parasitic on things like the golem and on a whole lot of other notions about creatures brought to life and animated. But it is hard not to think in this way, right? Some of our fears about artificial intelligence are because of science fiction. All of the stories in science fiction start here. For better or worse, this is the first narrative of the notion of what happens when humans bring things to life when they're not supposed to, or at least the first one that gets real traction. And granted, they exist in lots of other places, but the notion of using the most contemporary technology of the day to make something come to life, that's where that story starts, right? And it's about not actually electricity in its first past, it's about chemistry. But here you have that one, right? So if AI has a one story from the side, it would be Frankenstein. Just so you don't think that there aren't others, um, this would be the little happy Australian shout out here. So in 1891, Banjo Patterson wrote a story about a robot. Of course, he couldn't call it a robot story because the word robot didn't exist at that point. But he wrote a story about a cast iron man built in the city of Melbourne uh, by a genius, obviously. Um, and sold to a company that did door-to-door -door selling in the regional and remote communities in Australia. And the cast iron canvasser was designed to be something that was willing to do repetitive and boring tasks and be assailed and assaulted by dogs, publicans, policemen, and agitated housewives and house people. And so this machine is built and sent out into regional Australia where it can just keep repeating the same phrase over and over again about buying my encyclopedias, uh, where it is indeed set upon by all manner of things and ultimately killed in a river. <laughs> The reason I have that here is that the piece of this story that is subaltern is A, that you know, Australians had a bite at the proverbial apple in this sort of steampunky world, but also that it was understood that what the machinery would automate was boring processes in regional and remote Australia, a story that perhaps isn't as subaltern as it seems. There are, of course, other traditions of making technologies, not just making stories about technologies and of bringing things to life where the life isn't necessarily about the instrumentalist work of, well, you know, AI currently. Starting in 820 AD and again in the 1200s in Islam, particularly centered around Baghdad, there were a series of publications by a number of engineers, starting with the Bezu brothers and ending with Al Jazeera, who created books called the Books of Ingenious Mechanical Devices and Wonders. 
These are objects that were animated. They are the first appearances of things like the Archimedes screw. They're the first appearances of automata. This one in particular is about 10 feet high and was a mechanical elephant that poured water on your hands for Salah five times a day for praying. And arguably that's a tradition and a set of stories that are part of the constellation of things that get us to computers because that technology comes from Islam through the Enlightenment to people like Vaucasson and then Babbage, who in turn give us Ada Lovelace and ultimately Turing. So there are these other stories we could tell here about what these things look like. Or you could go in a different direction and go and look at the early forms of artificial life, although not artificial intelligence, in places like Japan. These are Karakuri. This is the exemplar version of it, again, from the late Edo period. So we're talking the late 1700s, early 1800s in Japan. Uh, this one is about this big, uh, like a meter high. Uh, it's got a mechanism inside of it made of whalebone and string, bless. And when you fill its little teacup with tea, it runs across the tea table. When you pick up the teacup, it bows at you and runs away again. <laughs> it's completely fabulous. Um, and it was designed to be part of a series of ceremonial things that were about grace and beauty and a set of appropriate kind of ritual activities. So their making things come to life wasn't about automating the dull and dirty and dangerous work. It was about making something possible that hadn't existed before that was in fact an act of, well, arguably grace. So a completely different kind of narrative for what artificial things might look like and the work they might do. You could keep pulling that thread and end up somewhere unexpected again more recently. So this is a piece of art called Return to a Square. It featured in an exhibit in London and then in New York and then in Washington and then in, D and then in San Francisco in 1968-1969. It's made by Fortran. So this is a piece of art made on an IBM plotter using Fortran, the original programming language, a programming language that touched metal. It was part of an exhibit called Cybernetic Serendipity. It was part of an exhibit that was designed to bring together computers and art in that same time period when the inheritors of the artificial intelligence community were worrying about simultaneous and instantaneous translation, there were a different group of computer scientists wondering what it might mean to use that same computational power to make art. And I think that might be one of AI's other alternate narratives. Because some of the very same people who went on to build the personal computer were at this exhibit. And some of the ideas that came through that run through computation to this moment in time. So lots of subaltern narratives. So where does that get you, right? Well, I think you could then ask, OK, well, those are all theoretical interventions. Did anthropologists ever intervene in any of this? And if so, what did that look like? Well, twice. Once between 1946 and 1954. There were a series of conferences held in New York City, funded by the Macy Foundation, to look at the future of many things. But from 1946 to 1954, there were a series of conferences, nine in all, that were held to discuss something described at that point as cybernetics. Cybernetics are uh, first defined by a man named Norbert Wiener, who was an American mathematician and early computer scientist, wrote that cybernetics would be the study of the interfaces between biological systems and technical systems, and about how those systems would communicate. He's one of the principal theorists that gives us systems and control theory, He's also an early roboticist. He and John von Neumann, who is the man who architected the ENIAC, a man who wrote the first sorting algorithm for computers, a man who was part of the Manhattan Project, and the man who is the unspoken grandfather and godfather of the 1956 conference was at these conferences. He and Norbert together asked two people, to bring together a group of philosophers, mathematicians, social scientists, and public policy people to think about the future of computing. The two people they asked were, of course, unsurprisingly, Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson. Mm -hmm. Mead, because she was at that point working quite closely with the US government, and because she was known to have pretty good contacts, and Bateson because, in fact, his work already on the ecologies of the mind, whilst not widely published, was starting to influence a bunch of mathematicians and computer scientists, and, well, mathematicians, not yet computer scientists, and linguists. Mead and Bateson brought together theorists from all over the place and held them in the most extraordinary conversations over a five to seven year period. 
They were freeform conversations. They generated extraordinary papers. The transcripts of them are demented. Mm -hmm. There is a genuinely amazing paper written as a transcript of an interview between Mead and Bates and 40 years after this event, remembering what was happening at it. That is sort of one of those remarkable reconstructions that's just worth a read just for that reason alone. What for me is interesting about this is cybernetics disappeared in America. It persisted in Russia, it stayed in Slovenia, it stayed in Latin America, but in the US and Europe it goes underground. And it partly goes underground because there was a notion running through these events increasingly that you could use this new power of computation to drive social change. And Norbert and Margaret and Gregory were seen as being just a little too much like socialists mm -hmm. in a period when that wasn't a very good thing to be. And the reason that, that it's here and it's part of this history is that in 1956, when McCarthy and Minsky and Shannon appeared to create an intellectual agenda out of nowhere, they were in fact building on a decade's worth of thinking that they didn't reveal. And that the reason artificial intelligence could come to life the way it did was because cybernetics was there before. And because people had already started to think through these issues. Of course, what gets lost in that move is the social piece and the biological piece and the human piece, and what stays is the technical piece. So I can't imagine that Mead was always happy about that. And Bateson stayed with this community, but he wasn't happy with it either. So there's that intervention, right? The first anthropological intervention was to attempt to bring a whole lot of people into the room and create an intellectual agenda to drive it forward, and they got subverted. The second one, well, that's me. Because when in doubt, you might as well just claim Margaret Mead as your own. <laughs> um, so as of 18 months ago, I came home to Australia. I've joined the Australian National University and I have an institute. You heard Carol describe it a little bit. What you should imagine that institute really takes as its central intellectual work is that artificial intelligence is here to stay. It is complicated. It is not singular. It is not monolithic, but it is about to go to scale. It's not going to be in computers solely. It's actually going to be in cars and buildings and streets and our bodies and the world around us. And at the moment, we don't have a language to describe it. Not only do we not have a language to describe it, we don't have a clear way of theorizing it and building it and regulating it and getting it to scale in a way that would let us continue to be human inside that world. So when the Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University asked me to come home, I asked him if he was willing to let me build a new applied science at the ANU and he went, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And I called him back two days later and went, you do know what I'm saying to you, right? <laughs> he said, oh, you'll be busy. <laughs> like, okay, good. So the work of my institute is straightforward. Build that new body of knowledge, whether you call it an applied science, an academic discipline, a new branch of engineering, I don't know. I also don't know what to call it yet because clearly cybernetics is taken. <laughs> applied cybernetics was a brief flirtation of mine, but I don't think that gets us anywhere. So we're going to build a new applied science. We know that means we need to find a community of people who care about it. And frankly, for me, that also finds ways of transmitting the knowledge very quickly out of the institution and back into the world. Uh, I'm not particularly interested in locking all that stuff up. I want to find ways of transmitting it. And I also want to move quickly because I think that we need to do so. So happily, the cost of you getting to be here and getting free lunch afterwards is that there's a website on this page here. <laughs> And as of two weeks ago, I convinced the Australian National University to let me take my first master's students next year uh, in February. I can take 10 students. It's fully funded. There's a stipend and a scholarship attendant to it. I don't care where you come from because it turns out if you're building a new discipline, there aren't any disciplines that matter. All disciplines matter. <laughs> my team already has 12 people in it, including myself. Uh, we have backgrounds in everything from nuclear physics, civil and electrical and systems engineering, computer science, human geography, anthropology, feminist, <laughs> feminist theory. We'll take anyone. I really don't. I'm, I'm missing at this point. I'm missing philosophers and architects. I got lawyers <laughs> doing really well. I don't have an economist. I'm not sure if that's a deficit or not, but don't tell the economists I said that. Um, <laughs> You know, it's hard to say. Uh, so we're going to take 10 students uh, anywhere from anywhere around the world, frankly, as long as they can be boots on the ground in Canberra in February and you have to stay in Canberra for a year, which I realise is a very steep price to admission. <laughs> but 10 students, applications are open now. They'll close end of the month, the middle of next month. Competitive process. 
Yes, please apply. That would be good. I'm already in. <laughs> Excellent. That's what I want to hear. Um, and so that's where we're at, right? At the moment, it's for me, it was how do you not wait for the degree to be perfect? How do you take students and iterate it? It's the one thing that I think was most powerful to me as a lesson from Silicon Valley is that you shouldn't wait till it's perfect. You should build it in real time and build it iteratively. And I figured building it iteratively with students was the best way to do that. So starting in February, we're going to attempt to do that. And then the hope is that we will build a series of formal degree programs around that, but also a series of ways of taking that information and starting to put it back into the world as quickly as humanly possible. Because although my colleagues at the Australian National University like to remind me I have a time scale problem, I would just like to think I have structured and appropriate impatience. <laughs> and I think, I think I would like to imagine something that is something that Faye would approve of. So with that, I'm gonna stop and say thank you and tell you that it is time for food out there. <laughs>